But mostly it should be on there. Be, if this goes like blurry, yeah, then I would say just make sure that that's pointed. More okay. On there. I mean, you might as well that, include that yeah. if you can. Yeah, like that maybe. Yeah. If you would, you know, yeah. Like, okay. So, right but how do we know if it's? See, this is the volume it's picking up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me blow on it. Did that do anything? It's definitely picking up volume, but I don't. Yeah, my. Or the settings. Yeah, it definitely seems like it's here. There. Um, do you just have to do settings on the Mac itself? Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's actually in the. Um, like, can I try? Like, uh, system preferences. No, but in uh, Tizzy's, there's a very important that we, uh, we've stayed in for years since about the year 2000. Yeti. So we need to go back there because we go to Tizzy's and Tizzy's is a little bit of well, the problem is that it's yeah, they are, they're, they're, they're beautiful. I don't know. I'll check to see if the audio is okay. We, we, okay. As I like, said, go elsewhere. Yeah. That we go to. Yeah. And there is a hotel dates from about 1300 on the on the Central Square, and uh, we started staying there about. I don't know, 12, 15 years ago, yeah, yeah. Um, and we've been back off and on over the years, and sometime like about 10 years ago, uh, long after we've been there, um, Rick Steves discovered the place, oh. so now they've got a number of Americans, <laughs> so now there are a number of Americans who show up there. It used to be all Germans. But I know, the, I think I've probably encountered two Americans in yeah. all our time as well, yeah. one time. Uh, one of them was in the uh, the Boxano Museum where um, Ertz and uh, oh, yes. the ice cream yeah. was. was, was and, uh, yeah, I, it, it, it's, it's clear that there's not many people from Britain or the United States because so much isn't in English. Yeah. Uh, well, when when we first started going to the to Tyrol, I, it was to other towns because of the recommendation of an American friend of ours who lived in Germany, had very good German friends, and went there with his German friends. And that, that would have been, I don't know, 1985, 1990 or something we've heard of it. And so, you know, it's, when, when we were those years, there was, there were, there were, there were tourists, but there were, everyone was German. Yes, there was not a tourist who wasn't a German. Yeah. yeah. I'm just surprised that there's virtually no Brits going there. Yeah. I don't. Again, maybe it's because you really need to speak Italian or German. And, and it, but it is so, it is so beautiful. Yeah. The, the Dolomites. Yeah, uh, are, are just the most spectacular. Yeah. We, we, as I, I mentioned to you, we go about every other year. One of our uh, supplies of the LeBron and red wine to typically yeah. go back and fill the car. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking forward to showing Joe and Alice. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, I mean, all the festivals that they have in the little villages. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, we've often been there in the autumn, so we've got all. The oh, wine festivals, yeah, and yeah. I mean, they, they'll have a Speck Fest in one town or a, or a Knoodle Fest in the next, <laughs> and it, it's just a, 
Uh, Sterzing does a Knurdle test. And, uh, you know, Sterzing, you know. Yeah, it's definitely the most amusing about it. From the <laughs> whether or not it's a Knurdle test. I can't. Tell you because uh, there's no clear indication which one it's uh, yeah. Anyway, but it sounds they're all they're all great. I mean, everyone comes out in their in their uh, finery here. Yeah. Their, uh, I mean, I could try to like yell into that, and then you'll. Know, yeah. We find Moran to be a, an astonishing pretty city, especially up near the, the Roman Bridge. If you know that, if we don't know it well. In fact, we didn't know it at all well. And that was one of the reasons. After speaking to you, that we thought we'd stop the talk. I'm responsible for you. You are. You're responsible. Yeah. For All right. Good. <laughs> you better say good. Anyway, it was a great trip. And, and but what, what we did started. is so we actually made a trip of about two and a half weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Great. In in um, at Samat, we flew into Geneva, and a week in Samat. Um, drove across Switzerland and through going over about five passes to yeah. another crossways through the Alps, and yeah. which yeah. brought us down to Murano, coming right. out of Switzerland. And uh, so you flew over the um, uh, what is that? Uh, I don't know. Silver yeah. Yacht, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There were at least four passes that we went over. Yeah. Yeah. Grinzel and uh, yeah. 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 anyway. Yeah. Um, and then and then we spent another week in in the Tasha route and then back in Zurich for our return flight. It was a great trip. But one of the fascinating things was almost everything. Accommodations, food, restaurants was half as expensive in Sujarol as in uh, as in Semar. Yeah, Just about that, half. That wouldn't surprise me at all. So. No, that doesn't surprise me at all. Hello, Betty. How are you? Good to see you. Likewise. Love coming back. Is that a good thing? I haven't seen it right now. Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the Borns again. I know you've all seen the light about climate change. We're all converted, so we're in the right place. This is the 47th, it hasn't always been called the Borns, but it is the 47th iteration of this research symposium for what is now the Climate Change Institute. Every year it gets more and more interesting. 
every year we try new things. One new thing that we are going to institute probably in the wake of this meeting is so take the mini papers that everybody has been producing, unless you have a good reason for us not to, we're going to number them sequentially and publish them as a proceedings through Digital Commons. Uh, it will look just like a journal. You can cite it. It will have a volume for the year. We're going to, we're really ambitious. We're going to go back and start with the first mini papers and give that volume one and work our way up. It might take a little while, but that's uh, one of the new things that we're doing with the symposium. Also, I don't want to disappoint anybody, but since I won't be here tomorrow, I can't do the usual wrap up. So you're going to be pun starved unless Carl, who's agreed to do it and has taken on this responsibility, can live up to the tradition. He said he will. So I want, I'm looking forward to report when it's over. All right. Last thing that I want to do before we get started and hear what we're really here for is to thank the people who really make this happen. Of course, Betty and Becky. If you look at the program, you note that although I'm listed as the chair, that's really an honorary title, they are listed appropriately as the doers of everything, and they are. Thank you very much. I can't say it tomorrow. Are you running the first session? Who's running the. Who's there you go. The first speaker. All right, so up first we have Emily Blackwood, um, and her title is Virtual Reconstructions of the Astra Collecting Site, Peru, Phase 1. Hello, I'm Emily Blackwood. Thanks you, thank you all for coming today. I'd first like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples uh, whose land our campus and the symposium is being held on, as well as the indigenous peoples land where I'm doing my research. I am just finishing up my first semester of my interdisciplinary PhD program, which I designed myself and focuses on using virtual reality as a platform to showcase, preserve, and archive archaeological sites and excavation. The site I will be talking about today is the Ostra Collection Site, which is located in Peru. And it has the potential to be one of the earliest defensive sites in South America, which I will get into a bit more shortly. So what is virtual reality? In a nutshell, it's a computer-generated simulation that provides a platform to reconstruct real-world environments in an immersive and interactive way. In the case of my research, I am using it to reconstruct what the Ostro collection site looked like while it was being occupied. This particular site has been radiocarbon dated to approximately 6,600 uh, calibrated years before present, and it looked very different back then than it does in present day, which is part of the reasoning for creating a virtual simulation of its past environment, as humans are innately bad at data visualization. The VR lab that I work on on campus, the Virtual Environment and Multimodal Interaction Lab, or VEMI for short, uses VR to study data visualization and people's reactions when put in certain situations. We use the HTC Vive, which is located over here, um, for several reasons. It's relatively inexpensive, it comes with built-in headphones, and it also comes with two controllers that can be used to navigate the virtual environment. The headphones foster an additional layer of immersion because they allow you to hear sounds, such as the crunching of sand under your feet when walking around, especially as this is a desert environment, as well as any sounds that would be present or associated with the site, such as water, animals, or wind. The controllers reduce the occurrence of motion sickness, which is a pretty common issue with using VR, because they allow the user to teleport from one place to another instead of having to walk long distances. So these controllers here, what I would do if I wanted to go to the back of the room from this podium is I would aim the controller at the back of the room, use the trigger, and it would teleport me there instead of having to walk that long distance, which is one of the reasons that causes a lot of motion sickness and something that I'm particularly susceptible to, so this has helped a lot. <laughs> so in order to create 
this reconstruction, I had to develop a protocol for data collection. Some of you may be familiar with VR and its applications to archaeological sites, such as the Pyramids of Giza or Machu Picchu. But this work has been focused on structures that are above the surface, not below. My research entails reconstructing what lies both above and below the surface so that the user can experience an excavation through the eyes of the excavator. Now, I must caution that this research is in a phase one stage because as part of my protocol, I wanted to test what could be created using minimal equipment as archeologists generally have pretty limited funding. So what I wanted to use was a drone, a handheld camera, and an iPhone. But as you'll see in a few minutes, I think the results are quite promising. So to start, I overlaid the site, which is here, with a 20 by 20 meter grid, and at each vertex, so at each one of these points, I took eight photographs to create a 360 degree image from that vantage point, which you can see here. This is an important step because I needed to know how things appeared from different points across the site in order to create a virtual environment that is as accurate as possible. These photos provide me with surface texture that I would then use to texture the 3D model of the site. And sometimes it pays to have friends in high places because we were able to fly a drone over the site and use that data to create a 3D base layer of the site. Um, once this was completed, we had just enough time to excavate and collect data from one, a one by one meter unit within a nine by nine meter stone structure. Now as archeologists know, the data that we collect during the excavation process takes the real world 3D data and transforms it into 2D data in the form of photographs, level sheets, and field notes. These data are extremely difficult to visualize due to the massive quantities and spatial layout of a site, which can sometimes be quite vast. VR allows us to take these 2D data and translate them back into the original 3D context. These are just some examples of the types of 2D data that I recorded in the field. In the upper left here is an example of a wall profile and what we can do is take the actual levels here, and because we know the depths below the surface for each of these levels, we can recreate them in a virtual context. In the upper right is Jan Samwise, my advisor, who is taking copious field notes as we begin our excavation process. In the lower right, you can see the bottom of a particularly challenging level because you can see all of the individual rocks in here, which cannot be removed until the level is completely excavated. And each and every one of these rocks is plotted for depth and location. I think it took me about two hours to do this particular level. Um, now, if you recall earlier, I mentioned that the site has the potential to be the oldest defensive site in South America. Well, that is because of the presence of what we call slingstone piles. <laughs> So an example is here of what one of the piles looks like, and here's an example of what one of the stones looks like. These piles are currently being dated using OSL, and if their dates uh, correspond to the radiocarbon dates, that's great. But if they don't, I can still incorporate them into the virtual re reconstruction, but they would only appear at their appropriate time. Now, because we're using the vibe for this, and it has those controllers, the user will be able to actually pick up the sling stones, sling them themselves, which further adds to the immersion of the simulation without taking away the contextual integrity of the site itself. So, let's see if this will play. Could you push that or if you can see it? Yes, okay. So this is where I'm at right now. This is the 3D model that's been created from the drone. And as we're zooming in here, you can see this is the nine by eight meter stone structure. It's by no means done. It's just a place marker to show you the scale of the size of it in terms of the rest of the site. And as we zoom in, this upper left-hand corner is the unit that we excavated in. And as it's going to pan upwards, Back here, I will be adding the Andes Mountains. And as it comes this way, you can see an outline here, which is actually the outline of an ancient shoreline. So this is where the ocean was about 6,600 years ago, all in this area. And as you can see now, it's just desert 
because the ocean is five kilometers that way. And having personally and physically been at the site, it's very difficult to visualize what this entire area looked like when the ocean was there, while it was present, because it changes the entire environment of the area and what's going on there, the plant life, the ocean, everything that's there. So as we keep panning, this is all ocean. These are our field vehicles, which will be taken out. And as it keeps coming this way, you'll start to see a little black speck, which is our colleague Gloria, right here, who is doing OSL dates of the slingstone piles. There's one uh, line, the south line, that is here. And the second line starts roughly about here, and it'll continue along as this pans along the ridge. So how I've created this is using the software of Unity 3D Game Engine. And when you first open the application, it seems very intimidating. There's a lot of different aspects that go into it. But it's a fairly easy learning curve. And there, once you start doing some tutorials and you get a lot more used to it, it goes a lot better. So they go along this ridge line. Again, the Andes will be added in the back here. So next steps that need to be taken, I need to texture the stone structure, and through excavation, because we know it's made of granite, I'll be able to create what we call a skin and overlay that on the structure itself so it appears as a granite structure. The photos that I took using the 20 by 20 meter grid are geo-referenced, so I know their exact locations, and I can use those to create the surface textures because the drone wasn't able to get a high enough resolution that we need. I have to create the water layer for the ocean of where it is. Model the slingstone piles, which I can do because we know the dimensions of the piles themselves and the dimensions of the stones, as well as model the excavation unit, which is probably going to be the most tricky part because I actually have to go down into the model itself. And with that, I would like to thank Dan and Betty Churchill and the Churchill Exploration Fund, mm -hmm. without which I would not have been able to complete my field work, the Benny Lab, who has helped me create this, and my research team that was in the field with me, Dan Sanwise, Alice Kelly, Jim Roscoe, Gloria Lopez, and Jim Munch. And I'm told to play them up, so thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of what you were showing was from drones. Yes. Do you have plans uh, for collecting the finer, closer stuff that, like the dig site that you were yeah. showing, or objects from the dig site? Yes, that is phase two. Where we'll be going back not this summer, but next summer, and we're going to use a lot more photogrammetry and a lot more accurate um, measurements of where things are so that we can actually, ex in the virtual version of it, re excavate and let things. Uh, artifacts and everything will appear as you go deeper and down into that, and photogrammetry comes into a lot of play of that, as well as doing some free scanning of artifacts. The goal for this is when you're in the headset to be able to have a menu button that you can click on, and a list of the types of artifacts that are found on the site will show up, and you can pick them up with the controllers and look around, kind of spin them around, and see what they look like. I mean, forgive me if you already did mention this, uh, who do you see as using this and for what purposes? I think this can be used uh, across the board in classrooms. I think this can be in museums exhibits. Uh, I think it has a lot of potential to go to indigenous people and just because we can create it doesn't mean that it has to become publicly available. It can just be for tribal usage if they want to use it that way, but I think it's a great way to preserve the data because it's very difficult to visualize and keep track of everything in your head, of everything that's going on at the site. And by having this, you can kind of spread it out and look at everything across the site as you go down layer by layer. I think that's my time. So thank you. All right, up next we have Aaron McConnell uh, speaking of impacts of glacier surface melt on isotope signal preservation and uh, in Arctic ice cores. Okay, hi 
I am Erin. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a part of my master's thesis research, which is on the impacts of glacier surface melt on isotope signal preservation in Arctic ice cores. And first, I just want to thank the sources of funding that I've used for my uh, fieldwork and masters so far, CCI, the Churchill Escalation Fund, uh, Maine Space Grant Consortium, and NSF. So before I get into the rest of the project, I'll take a minute and talk about the significance um, of this project. So you probably know that the Arctic has been warming at a higher rate than the rest of the world. As you can see in um, this map from the Climate Reanalyzer, this is from the ERA Interim Climate Reanalysis Product, and it's showing surface temperature anomalies since the 1980s. This is the United States, and this is the Arctic Circle, and brighter red shows a higher rate of warming. And the climate changes that we're seeing as a result of this warming has made it increasingly necessary for communities in the Arctic to adapt. And to do so, we have to understand how hydroclimate tends to vary in this region. By hydroclimate, I just mean climate as it specifically relates to the transport of moisture um, from one part of the world to another through atmospheric circulation. This is especially relevant to the North Pacific because it's a very atmospherically complicated region. You have uh, many natural cycles of climate variability that are active and interact with each other here. And as um, the boundary conditions that control these cycles are warming as a result of anthropogenic climate change, we're likely to see increased variability in things like temperature, precipitation amounts, storminess, and resource availability. Ice core records can help us reconstruct the past and predict future hydroclimate variability in the Arctic. To reconstruct past climate using ice cores, we rely on a well-established relationship between stable isotope ratios and temperature. And an isotope is just a form of a chemical element that has a different mass. So since we're looking at ice, we measure the isotopes of water molecules, so um, oxygen and hydrogen. And we are measuring ratios. So with oxygen, we look at the ratio of 18O to 16O, and with hydrogen, that is two hydrogen to one. And so you would take your ice core from a glacier, and a warm period is associated with a heavier, um, a higher isotope ratio, so more heavy isotopes whereas a cool period is associated with a lower um, ratio, so more lighter isotopes. And with this, we're able to reconstruct paleo temperatures and also count annual layers in the ice core um, using the fact that temperature changes throughout the year based on the season. But once you add melt into this, um, and I mean melt on the surface of a glacier that percolates downwards and causes isotopes to redistribute in the core, um, you go from this nice, well-preserved record to this record that's dramatically reduced in amplitude and makes it hard to use that record to reconstruct temperatures and pick out annual layers. So the research questions that are guiding this part of the project are first, what is the climate threshold that's required for isotope signal preservation in Arctic ice cores? And by climate threshold, I mean the interplay between the mean annual temperature, accumulation rate, the amount of that accumulation that melts each year. And before I get to my second question, I'll just orient you with my field site in the St. Elias Mountains, which are in the Yukon, Canada. So if you're familiar with the area, this is Mount Logan, which is Canada's highest peak. This is Eclipse Ice Field, or I'll be calling it Eclipse for the rest of this talk. Um, Eclipse is about 3,000 meters above sea level, and our group has an ice core record that dates back to about 1,400. And divide, our ice field divide, um, is about 30 kilometers away from eclipse in distance and about 400 meters lower in elevation. And we have a weather station, a divide that's been recording temperature and accumulation since the early 2000s. So my second question is, how well preserved are isotope signals at eclipse and divide, both in comparison to each other and to our other Arctic ice core sites, and why? And we're able to see why using these um, records that we have from these two sites. So some of the methods that we've used to investigate these questions are first ground penetrating radar, which allows us to image the subsurface stratigraphy or layering of the ice for evidence of meltwater influence. We have ice cores from both eclipse and divide, which allow us to measure the amplitude of the isotope signal and determine whether it's affected by melt. And we're also able to estimate the accumulation rate of eclipse using the ice core. Um, we also have uh, meteorological records, both in situ and remotely sensed from the NASA MODIS Ice Surface Temperature Database. This allows us to compare the temperatures at each site and um, calculate the accumulation rate of divide using our weather station record. Um, to compare these sites with, uh, with elsewhere in the Arctic, we use published records from other Arctic ice core sites, specifically looking for mean annual temperature, annual accumulation rate, 
malt percent or how much of that annual accumulation melts during the melt season and the amount of isotope signal alteration. And where mean annual temperature wasn't rec uh, recorded, we used a climate reanalysis pro uh, product from the University of East Anglia Climatic Research Unit to calculate the temperatures in the sites. So moving on to the results, in our low resolution radar transects from Eclipse and Divide, um, this is Divide in the top panel, and you notice at this um, depth of 25 meters what we infer to be a fern aquifer, meaning that meltwater on the surface of the glacier is percolated downwards and accumulated at this depth. And in Eclipse, we did not see the same layer, although we do see avalanche debris at the edges of our transect, we see much more meltwater influence in the stratigraphy of Divide. We also have ice cores at Eclipse. So this is um, showing the timescale overlaps between three separate ice cores. In the top panel, the, um, these are cores drilled in 2017 and 2016. And then the bottom panel in 2016 in black and 2002 in red. And we see that over time, um, the signal amplitude of these cores is very well preserved, indicating that there are negligible melt effects happening at Eclipse. On um, divide, we see a different result. So this is the oxygen record in two similar length ice cores taken from eclipse in blue and divide in orange. And this is showing the record versus depth in the core. So in eclipse, you see these nice and well-preserved oscillations or seasonal signals in the isotope record. But at divide, you see this more flat line indicating that um, there has been significant melt water percolation at divide that's caused this signal alteration or reduction in amplitude. So despite the proximity of eclipse and divide, we do see the significant difference in melt. So um, why do we see this difference? So according to our in-situ record of air temperatures, this is from instrumentation at each site that was in place for one year from 2016 to 2017, with divide in blue and eclipse in orange. And we see that eclipse is consistently about one degree cooler than divide. And we also see this reflected in our remotely sensed um, MODIS temperature records, which come at daily resolution from 2002 to 2017. So um, this is an example day that you would download from the NASA website, and it exemplifies what we see in most of these days, which is that divide is about 1.8 de degrees warmer than eclipse in the symmetry. So to summarize this, um, eclipse is consistently about 1 to 2 degrees cooler than divide. We also see similar accumulation rates at these sites um, based on the eclipse ice core accumulation record and the divide weather station accumulation record. And this has been seen elsewhere in the North Pacific, um, where temperature increases are associated with disproportionate amounts of melt. Winsky and others found that at Mount Hunter in Alaska, a 1.9 degree increase in temperature is associated with a 60-fold increase in melt, so this is normal for this region. So expanding the analysis to include other Arctic ice core sites, um, these are sites that are pretty well distributed around the Arctic. This is Eclipse and Divide. And um, this figure summarizes what we've found for mean annual temperature on the bottom and accumulation rate in meters water equivalent per year on the y-axis. So the markers are color-coded to match these sites around the Arctic, and the size of the marker corresponds to how much signal alteration we're seeing at those sites, with larger markers indicating more of a signal washout from melt. So a couple things to point out are that um, Around negative 10 degrees, we see alteration in the signal um, within a pretty wide range of accumulation rates. Um, and one outlier we see is here, which is from Mount Waddington in um, British Columbia. This is from a study by Neff and others. And they found that despite this, um, this being the warmest site that we studied, um, it receives almost seven meters water equivalent of accumulation per year. So that the annual accumulation layer is so thick that the um, melt water can't percolate all the way through it. And this causes the signal to remain preserved in the site. So to wrap this up, we find that high mean annual temperatures and or low accumulation rates are associated with isotope signal loss in Arctic ice cores. In the San Elias, specifically, we find the temperature increases of 1 to 2 degrees from eclipse to divide results in this melt-related signal loss. There's also been a study here recently by Porter and others that found that today's northwestern Canada is about 1.7 degrees warmer than the Holocene thermal maximum, which was previously thought to be the warmest point in the Holocene. So putting these two pieces of information together, um, since Eclipse has this well-preserved signal now, um, we infer that it, it has had a well-preserved signal throughout the Holocene, since now it's been shown to be warmer than the rest of the Holocene. 
So in the future, I aim to use the well-preserved Eclipse ice core record to calibrate that record with instrumental climate data, both from the Divide Weather Station and elsewhere in the region for moon analysis products, and um, see what aspects of regional climate are being recorded in that Eclipse ice core. And I'll be presenting on that in my defense over the summer. So with that, I'm being told to come up, so I'll take questions, and thanks for listening. <laughs> Mean annual temperature, but one would think that mean annual temperature would be as relevant as days above freezing during the summertime. Do you have the data to test that hypothesis? Yeah, so some of the sites we looked at did report um, positive degree days or mean annual or mean summer temperature. Um, I just reported mean annual temperature here because it was pretty widely reported in the sites I was looking at. And um, if you have a high mean annual temperature, you do also tend to see warmer, more positive degree days in the summer that would pass that melt. But yeah, you're right that summer is um, important to look at since that's when the melt is happening. So. That's the only time that matters, really, isn't it? Yeah, that's the melt season. Um, but yeah, we, I chose to report mean annual temperature since it was just a consistent way of, of representing the temperatures that we tend to see at these sites. Thanks. All right, uh, next up is Anne again, uh, speaking of multi-level governance of climate change adaptation, exploring synergies and barriers to adaptation and implementation in Samoa. Hi, everyone. So um, today I'm going to talk about a piece of my research that's looking at multi-level governance of climate change adaptation in Samoa, as just stated. Um, and specifically to start off, I want to mention I'm talking about the independent state of Samoa, not American Samoa, which is its neighbor just to the south. So we're talking about the independent country. Um, and this work was done in close collaboration with Anima Salopa, who graduated from UMaine's graduate program in the School of Marine Sciences last year and is originally from Samoa, so she was um, very integral to this project. So to start off, I want to situate us um, in, in Samoa, and this picture is taken at one of the higher uh, elevation areas of the country, and I want to bring your attention to where people are located, um, where the infrastructure is, and it's clearly uh, very close to the coastline, as you can see, and that's uh, true of the whole country. So as we zoom out, um, and we look at Samoa, there are two main islands, and then there are eight smaller islands, which you can uh, barely see in this image. Um, but So we're located to the northeast of New Zealand in this small red box here. Um, and the picture I just showed you is where that orange box is on Opolu, which is the island that has the majority of the population in Samoa. And then the other main island is Savai, which we're going to talk about next. And the specific location I'm going to speak about is in the yellow box. So my goal in the fieldwork in Samoa um, is to understand two countrywide adaptation projects in their final stages of implementation. Um, and while on Apolu, I stayed with Anima's family, but then when we traveled to Savai, these were the uh, follies that we stayed in while we were doing our research. And so I kind of want to paint a picture here of conducting interviews, which is my main way of doing research, as well as visiting these adaptation fund projects while returning to these houses literally over the ocean uh, to sleep at night. And so we're hearing about elevated rates of coastal erosion, uh, extreme and more intense weather events. You all know this story. Um, and drought is also another major picture for um, this area of Samoa. And then in addition to that, the Samoan uh, government uh, talks a lot about tsunamis, which we know are not directly related to climate change, but are a really important way for communicating the intensity of these um, extreme weather events and other impacts of climate, because Samoans have a really strong understanding of what those impacts mean. Um, they were most recently hit by a tsunami in 2009. So um, one of the days that I returned to 
the, the fallet to sleep, this massive storm blows through, not an extreme weather event for those who have approved my risk management, uh, but, <laughs> um, you know, it definitely gave me this very brief but real sense of uh, thinking about all these different impacts that um, people had been telling me that they'd experienced while um, being in this physical setting very exposed um, to the elements. So, the idea I want to share here is really the extent to which these communities and the national government are thinking about adaptation as a real necessity. And um, while most villages aren't actually located like this on top of the ocean, they're just set back from the coast. Um, so they're really on the front lines of dealing um, with these impacts. And what we hear in the interviews is reflected in the data that we see here. So increased um, temperature from the late 1970s to present, as well as experience and projected increases in sea level rise. And so the real question becomes kind of how is Samoa, and in my case I'm specifically looking at the national government, how, how are they dealing with these challenges? And the primary way that Samoa has gone about this is in soliciting international funding. And that's come from a, ver a variety of different sources, and we can see signage all over the islands, from the Adaptation Fund to funding for Sustainable Development Goal work, funding from the UN Development Program in association with other countries, countries from uh, all their kind of neighboring regions, New Zealand, Australia, China, Japan, have all invested in adaptation in Samoa. And then we also see a lot of investment coming in from the World Bank. Um, but for the purposes of my research, I'm specifically looking at the Adaptation Fund and the World Bank program, pilot program for climate resilience. And so in looking at um, these two projects, we have a really great opportunity in Samoa to look at how the national government and all these different entities within the country are looking at kind of the, this idea of multi-level governance. And it's a necessity be, to be thinking about this because we, uh, the money is definitely coming from the international level. Oftentimes, usually it has to flow through the national government and then ultimately these projects are implemented in communities where all these signs are posted. Um, so we really need to be thinking about uh, the challenges that are inherent in working across all of those different levels. And so, sorry. Um, so what does multi-level governance, and we can add in to that as well, multi-scale governance um, really mean? And this schematic from Cash at All 2006 helps us to illustrate this a bit. Um, we can see that different, all these different scales that are running across the top here, so spatial, temporal, jurisdictional, et cetera. And we can think about um, governance over these different scales and, and levels. Um, and what we need to be considering is the fact that they're interacting constantly um, throughout the entire process of climate adaptation from uh, these projects being conceived and being implemented and monitored. And so my project is focused on understanding where work is happening effectively across these different levels of governance, and then where are there barriers to uh, multi-level -gover multi governance happening effectively, with the idea behind that being that when there's more intentional support between these different levels and scales that you have overall more effective governance of the system. Um, so, to, so to illustrate this, um, one example is we can take this jurisdictional scale, which is looking at intergovernmental interactions, so above the national level to the national level, provincial level, and then these the local level, right? And then we can think about, well, how does, if we pick the national level, how do they think about this other scale of temporal, and how do they interact over these different time scales? And so you can kind of draw this picture for any uh, set of interactions that you want to look at for, for the purposes of this presentation will we'll, uh, keep coming back to kind of this example here. And so what does this look like in Samoa? Um, the two adaptation projects that it looked like, as it looked at, as I mentioned, funded by the Adaptation Fund and the World Bank, have done a host of different uh, projects over the course of their implementation. They flew LIDAR lines, they updated community integrated management plans um, in every single village in the country, and then they've also carried out some of these physical projects of which I'm showing a few of them here. 
So on the coast, they've done work to install wave breaks to decrease erosion in the specific beach area. Um, and then they've also put up this seawall uh, to also deal with erosion. Um, in higher elevation areas, it's more focused on reforestation in water catchment areas. Um, and then there's also some focus on building inland roads. And you might wonder why roads are adaptation, but their justification for this is that they serve as evacuation routes, as well as possible encouragement for people to voluntarily relocate their homes permanently inland. Um, so if we return to this idea of multi-level and multi-scalar governance, um, we have to think about all these adaptations I just named and some more that I'll talk about in the context of this overall systems uh, approach and this overall big picture. Um, and what we start to see emerge is the, this idea of adaptation trade-offs. So one example in thinking about these timescales in the national government is that the national government is thinking about these different timescales, right? So they know that in the long term, the majority of the coastal communities are going to need to move inland. And so that's kind of why these roads are a major part of the adaptation uh, picture. But at the same time, they're also implementing these short-term adaptations, like putting in these rainwater catchment tanks, which help people to deal with the coastal springs becoming salinated. And there also is a big debate about seawalls. So for decades, countries, or the Samoan um, government was promoting seawalls, but now they're realizing not so effective, causing lots of other problems, as many people in this room know about. Um, and so they're trying to not do support as many seawalls, but at the same time, this project is continuing to fund seawalls. And as one government uh, ministry person expressed to me, uh, the problem with seawalls is that they create this perceived sense of security that isn't truly there. Uh, when events are extreme enough, they'll just go over these walls, which you can see are not that large. Um, so we have this question of do these short-term adaptations, like putting in these rain water catching tanks and building additional seawalls, um, inhibit the ability to take on these longer-term adaptations that are going to be necessary? Um, and I will take one more second here to wrap up in saying that one of the additional challenges here is that the way that we evaluate these projects um, is that we ask questions about the procedure. So when the adaptation fund is evaluating how this project succeeded, the question is, did they, how much cement did they use? What did they do with the leftover cement? How much did it cost? And who, who put it in? And they don't ask questions about, did this project actually make the community more resilient to the impacts of climate change? And so in that, we have a real challenge in that these trade-offs aren't really being considered in the evaluation of these final projects, which leaves us with uh, little room for building upon these really important questions to think about. So I'll leave it there. Probably have time for one question. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could give some idea of why you decided to focus in on um, governance as opposed to economics or the cultural realm, you know, the ideas of some elements about climate change. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, mainly because the focus of my whole uh, master's project centers around studying the UN and the way that climate change adaptation projects that are uh, structured at the international level are implemented at the national and local level. So because I guess of that initial framing, the governance lens was the one I used. However, people's perceptions of climate change and especially the question of relocation is going to be critical to think about in terms of the cultural and economic piece as well. No doubt that that all needs to be part of the picture. Up next is Noel Potter, uh, speaking about cosmogenic really intense surface exposure dating uh, marine chronology of late Holocene climate fluctuations, Hooker Glacier, Southern Alps, New Zealand. Thank you, Aaron and Wayne, for the joining session, and thank you, Betty and Becky, for coming to you, and thank you all for being here. I'm going to jump right into telling you about 
cosmic guy really kind of searches for every day um, to look at the late Holocene and the Southern Holocene. So, uh, the research question I want to answer, uh, most basic level, how did climate change during the past roughly 1,500 years in New Zealand Southern Alps? Um, and I also want to ask how that Southern climate change uh, did or did not compare well with uh, the European record, which shows the medieval climate optimum or the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age, uh, two very well-known periods of uh, climate history in the <coughs> recent geologic past. Um, background on those, for those of you who are not too familiar, um, the medieval climate optimum, the medieval warm period, was a period from about 750 to 1250 common era, um, when, at least in the European Alps, uh, glaciers uh, retreated dramatically, uh, and that was attributed to warm conditions, which are also recorded in things like crop records, um, various historical records, and then the Little Ice Age, immediately followed the medieval warm period where medieval climate optimum um, and ran from about 1250 to 1850 common era um, and uh, glaciers in the European Alps re-advanced back over uh, positions that had been uh, left free of ice during the medieval warm period. And to examine this time period in the southern hemisphere record uh, we are using the moraines, uh, which you can see well preserved here on the left lateral side at the terminal position of uh, the Hooker Glacier. Uh, the Hooker Glacier flows down from the slopes of Eiraki or Mount Cook, uh, the tallest mountain in New Zealand, um, and it's just to the east of the main divide, um, which runs uh, north northeast to southwest uh, along the South Island of New Zealand uh, through the Southern Alps. And uh, we use mountain glaciers like the Hooker Glacier as a climate proxy because especially here in the Southern Alps, they are uh, especially sensitive to temperature. Um, they uh, respond very quickly to changes in climate at the terminus because there's a lot of precipitation coming down on the main divide, which leads to very high uh, throughputs of ice. And uh, because of the geometry in particular of the Hooker Valley, we get nicely preserved moraines that uh, show that we can date to tell us when uh, this glacier expanded in response to cooler climates in the past. Uh, we also, at the Hooker Glacier, have a really nice historical record uh, around the turn of the 20th century the glacier was occupying much more of the valley. There was no lake. Uh, the terminus was out here, right up against the terminal moraines that we sampled. Um, and the ice was much fuller, almost, uh, it looks kind of like an inflated balloon. Uh, and if you compare that to these pictures in the mid, 20th, mid to late 20th century, uh, the lake that is now about three kilometers long from shore to glacier terminus uh, only started to form in the mid-1970s but you can also see that this ice is looks much more deflated there was a lot of surface lowering to the glacier and then this is what that valley looks like in 2013. Um, after that period of surface lowering once the lake started to form the terminus really rocketed back rapidly um, and so, pardon me, um, what we're hoping to do, or what we hoped to do in our research, was to get the ages of these moraines to know, again, um, the history of this glacier's advances and retreats prior to uh, the historical record. Um, to do this, we first had to have a really good understanding of the landscape, which involved a lot of field work on the ground, but also involved mapping with a drone. Um, we stitched together uh, drone imagery into a 3D model uh, using Antisoft's PhotoScan software. 
and it gave us a beautiful uh, ortho mosaic map that really shows this wonderful detail and uh, very high resolution digital elevation model. And uh, having these really improved the understanding of what I was able to see in the field on the ground and gave us the context we needed to understand what we were doing in the lab with surface exposure dating uh, using Berlin 10. Um, when a boulder is exposed to open sky, uh, which we take to mean when it falls off a glacier, it starts uh, accumulating the element or the isotope of beryllium, beryllium 10, at a known rate um, because of exposure to cosmic background radiation. And because we know the rate at which that accumulates, if we can determine how much beryllium 10 there is in a sample from a boulder, like this one, we know at what time that boulder was deposited by the glacier. Um, and when we can do this with boulders that are on the crest of a moraine, we are able to use that information to navigate to the moraine and the time at which the glacier occupied the position mark. <coughs> I'm going to show you a lot of data in one slide. Don't worry, I'll show it to you in a more digestible format uh, <coughs> afterwards. But these are the dates of the moraines uh, all around the Hooker Valley that we got from about uh, 32 samples. Um, over here on the left lateral side, these three moraines are smack dab in the middle of medieval time. Uh, so the glacier was at its most advanced positions during this time uh, in medieval times when Europe was warm. Um, so already we're seeing that maybe the New Zealand record doesn't match the uh, European record very well. And then throughout the period of uh, the Little Ice Age in Europe, uh, the glacier was leaving moraines episodically marking a relatively slow, steady retreat with occasional pulses of stability or uh, re-advance to the Moraine. And uh, in addition to my data set, we have many, many dates from previous work from my advisors and their colleagues um, in the area. This is Hooker Lake, uh, Hooker Glacier and its Moraines. Mueller Glacier and the nearby Tasman Glacier also have quite a few Holocene dates uh, or Holocene moraines, which have ages uh, of about 500 AD, 175 AD, uh, and then several back into uh, before Common Era, as well as many moraines constructed during the interval, which is denoted as the Little Ice Age in the European record. Um, here, the background image is the European record for reference with the Iron Age, Warm Period, Dark Ages, Cool Period, Medieval Warm Period, and Little Ice Age. And these lines are uh, in red, my data, uh, the ages of my moraines, and in black and yellow, the ages of uh, moraines previously dated. And what I want you to take away here is that Moraines were being constructed in New Zealand. That is, conditions were cool enough that the glacier was advancing or stable um, during both warm and cool periods in the European record. So it looks like there is um, there is no uh, relationship of either in phase or out of phase uh, between the European climate and the New Zealand climate. That is until about the last century when the Hooker Glacier was retreated rapidly, just like glaciers around the world have re retreated dramatically in response to anthropogenic warming. Um, this is the last couple hundred years. Uh, the red are European glacier records, the blue are New Zealand records. You can see that the uh, New Zealand glaciers have tended to retreat dramatically a bit later, or start that retreat later than the European glaciers. 
and we take the timing of that around 1940 as um, a cue to lead us towards the hypothesis that um, this modern retreat in New Zealand and in general responsiveness of the New Zealand glaciers to um, regional climate may largely be driven by warm water extensions of the East Australian current um, coming into the Tasman Sea and generating Tasman Sea heat waves in response to uh, shifts north and south of the southern hemisphere west of the wind belts. And these are the things that I just told you. I do want to thank the Churchill Exploration Fund, the Kassad Family Foundation, the National Geographic Society, and all the people who helped me in the field in the lab. Thank you. Next is Susan Elias, uh, speaking about deer ticks helped along by warming climate and deer. <laughs> okay, we're going to go from those beautiful slides of New Zealand um, to thinking about the landscape in a pathogenic way. Um, I finished up my PhD work. And I'm going to focus in on a couple of aspects, the relationship between climate change and white-tailed deer and nymphal deer ticks. So the problem is increasing Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases in the state. Uh, Maine is, over the past five years, is basically the highest Lyme incidence state in the nation. Um, Lyme disease is a very curable, treatable disease if caught early, but for some people it lasts a long time and is very debilitating. In the last five years, there's been a 33% jump in Lyme disease, but actually there's been a 600% jump in anaplasmosis and babesiosis. And part of this could be increased disease discovery, but it's definitely also has to do with transmission from ticks to humans. Um, also, you may remember in 2013, a healthy woman died of Powassan encephalitis virus. Um, so she was bitten by a, an infected tick. So what's going on with this? Well, we know that we're experiencing northward range expansion of deer ticks in the state. The deer tick is an invasive species. But it's fair to ask, it's fair to ask to what extent is climate change helping this expansion along? There's lots of factors driving deer ticks, but, but climate change must be part of it in Maine, right? Because we're at the northern extent of its range. It, they get into Canada too, but we're, we're all part of this northern fringe. So these, these data come from my laboratory at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute, and any town that has a color in it has had a tick submitted to our lab. So we know where the ticks are. Okay, so we're thinking about the climate suitability envelope for deer ticks. And to, to understand what's really happening at the level of the tick biologically, we've got to know a little bit about the life cycle. And I really want to jump over there, but I think then I'd get away from the mic. But so if we, if we look uh, in the southeast corner, you see a little cluster of eggs. A deer tick female lays about 2,000 eggs. It's very gross. <laughs> so those eggs, though, have got to accumulate enough heat during the summertime to hatch. The larvae need to hatch out of those eggs towards the end of August. Now there's a threshold. You don't have to remember this number, but it's 1,240 degree days above 6 degrees Celsius. It's just a threshold, but it matters. So the larvae will feed on a little bird or a little mouse, and then if they get that blood meal, they will then molt to become nymphs, and they have to overwinter, winter number one in the two-year life cycle. And then those nymphs will emerge and after the winter time, and they will get really active. So watch out, right? Because it's the deer tick nymphs that transmit most Lyme disease to us, because they're tiny. They're the size of a poppy seed. We miss them. So they come out in the summertime and they'll feed on almost anything, large and small mammals, birds, reptiles, okay? 
they get that blood meal, and then in the same year, they will become a very bloodthirsty adult tick, and that adult tick is going to need to feed on a medium or large-sized animal. Most of them are going to feed on white-tailed deer. Then, that engorged female you see there, up in the northwest, she's got to survive another winter. So two winters, so they're, they're, they're behaviorally challenged to avoid very cold conditions in the winter, and in the summertime, they don't like it too wet, they don't like it too, too dry or too hot, they're just like Goldilocks, they're a little bit finicky. Okay, so how is the climate uh, suitability envelope shifting in Maine. Well, this is a, a difference map. We're comparing basically current winter situation to a two decades ago winter situation. And it's been warming throughout the state in the wintertime. We have shorter, more compressed winters. Um, but it is warming relatively faster in the northern tier of the state. This is good for ticks. Another way to look at it is the degree day accumulation. These lovely maps were done by Sean Burkle for the study. And this depicts degree day accumulation by the end of August. So if it's a warm color, you got there by the end of August. And if it's a cool color, theoretically, it's too cold for the deer tick to, to complete its life cycle because those eggs don't hatch in time. So you can see, though, if you look at the last decade, where the green is. But if you look at the current decade, you can see that degree day line shifting north. Again, good for ticks. Mm. All right. Let's take a look at their primary, for the adult tick, the primary blood meal host is a white-tailed deer. Most of those blood meals of those adult ticks come from white-tailed deer. So this map, this map of Maine, comes from Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. It shows the 29 wildlife management districts. Those are the districts used for managing big game, right? So moose, bear, and deer. So in the green colors, it's what I call the northern tier. It's colder. Uh, and in the blue, that's the southern tier. So Mainland Fisheries and Wildlife has goals for all of those wildlife management districts. And so there's this knowledge gap that's been out there. How do poll winners interact with white-tailed deer to affect nymphal densities, nymphal abundance in the environment? Okay. So that is one of the, the central questions of my work. So I decided to approach this question with a generalized additive model. The nice thing about generalized additive models is they let you look at non-linear relationships between your explanatory variables and your outcome, which is so typical of ecological systems, right? And in addition, you allow to look at each of those explanatory variables additively so you can look at joint effects. So my, my data set of nymphal ticks ran from 1990 through 2013. And so it's a spatiotemporal model. My spatial unit for the model was the Wildlife Management District. So here's a result. So on the, on the upright axis, the vertical axis, you have nymphal density. The numbers don't matter. It just goes from lower to higher. And then you've got a winter axis where, I don't know if you can see it, but it goes from minus 20. This is average minimal winter temperature. It goes from minus 20 to minus 5. So average minimal winter temperature of minus 20 is more like Aroostook County down into southern Maine. Okay. And then finally, on the other axis, you've got deer. So hopefully you can see that. It runs from 0 to 30 deer per square mile. Those are deer densities in those wildlife management districts. So there's been a number of empirical studies that ask the question, if we have very high deer densities and we lower those deer densities to a certain number, can we lower ticks enough to lower Lyme disease? It's a very good question. Now there are places where average deer density is up around 100 per square mile, very high deer densities. So the studies that lower deer density from 100 or 140 to say 50 per square mile, nothing happened. There was no discernible decrease in Lyme disease. But the studies that brought deer densities below 13 per square mile did see a reduction in Lyme disease. There's some debate over this. But what happened here, this is an observational study. We didn't manipulate deer here. This is just looking at the data from the state, all right? And I want to walk, I'm going to walk over there, okay? So. <laughs> 15, we'll just take minus 15, and we'll run up to the curve, and we see this threshold, which happens to be 13 per deer per square mile. 
it doesn't matter where you go, you can go to minus 10 and run up to that, that threshold. So the observational data here are sort of confirming those empirical studies, okay? But what about temperature? Well, let's just start with a low deer density, around four per square mile, not much happens. You can add all the heat you want, not much happens to nymphal density, okay? So you've really got to have enough deer before you see a nice relationship between temperature and nymphs. So all of this is to say that they're working together. They're working together. So let's make some predictions. On the left is basically our, our current situation with nymphal deer ticks. Again, summarized to the wildlife management district level. What happens if you add a degree warmer winter? What happens? You get about a 1.2 fold increase in nymphal ticks. Okay? Now, what if we manage deer from the current five per square mile on average in the northern tier? What if we manage that deer herd up to 10 or 15 per square mile? Well, what happens is you get a five to 10 fold increase in nymphal deer ticks. So, what I think we need to do with this is just take a look at our management goals. There's a number of other factors that drive tick density as well that I don't have time to get into. But, but what this really says is we, we can manage our landscape to manage our risk of tick bite. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, I would really like to thank all of the various individuals and um, institutions that have supported the work. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Dan. So I was curious, do the deer get sick from Lyme disease or they doesn't bother them? No, deer do an, an amazing thing. It's too bad that humans don't do it. So deer have the ability at the site of the bite. As a tick is biting the deer, the skin has this ability to kill the Lyme disease spirochete, Borrelia burgdorferi, is killed by the deer's immune system at the bite site. Oh, well. Which is different from mice, which go ahead and get infected, but their fitness really doesn't seem to be compromised by being, you know, a petri dish for the <laughs> Lyme bacteria. Yeah. That's awesome. yeah. Okay. Oh. So you, earlier in your talk, you mentioned that these ticks are invasive, um, mm -hmm. but they're native to to the eastern U.S. and they're migrating because of climate change. They're tracking their habitat. So I'm just wondering, uh, just kind of from a management perspective, mm -hmm. do you can you do do you think that they're still? I mean, do you think that they really are invasive, or do you think that 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 affects sort of the way that we manage them, or? or Okay, so, yeah, so that's a neat question because it's like, well, is the, is Ixodes scapularis, the deer tick, really an invasive species? And it probably really depends on the time scale. So it's thought that deer ticks in the past hmm, 100, 200 years, that, that, that long ago they used to be um, sort of hiding out these little foci, maybe in Long Island, um, maybe in Rhode Island, and, and not, not bothering us. But that big changes in landscape, mainly reforestation and suburbanization, I'm talking about a New England type landscape scale, um, and, and burgeoning deer herd across the region have all contributed sort of a perfect storm situation to, to bring the ticks back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there paleo tick records? Can you take this back further to warmer times, for instance? Can you take it back to warmer times? Well, I know you can take it back to the Iceman, because the Iceman had he had Lyme disease. Yes, he did. But he that doesn't take it back to the warmer times before that. Betsy? Yeah. But but actually, yes, yeah, the, the Lyme spirochete has been around a really, really long time and takes have been around even longer. They are very ancient creatures. But but Lyme disease in Maine, can you can you oh. track to answer the the question of whether it's an invasive species or not, do you have a sense of when ticks have ticks that could be carrying the disease or not have been living in Maine? Yeah, so the best we can really do is ask, were we, can we go back to ancient, ancient, not ancient, but very old medical journals? Did, was there a physician that kept track of, track of you know, um, European settlers getting sick or Native Americans getting sick? Was there a kind of malaise like a, um, associated with fever? Because it couldn't be diagnosed as Lyme disease as such because we really didn't identify the bacteria. I mean, we didn't even have germ theory, right, until the end of the 1800s. So people would be sick, but 
but I don't think there's a very good record for that. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, up next is Annie Saint-Mont uh, speaking of contribu uh, contributions from the archaeological record of uh, molluscan climate proxies in El Nino Southern Oscillation. Thanks, Aaron. It's so hard for to read all those titles. <laughs> I appreciate your efforts. Hi, everyone. My name is Annie. And today I'm going to be talking about the north coast of Peru and El Nino Southern Oscillation and proxies we use to reconstruct this climate phenomenon. So, as many of you probably know, ENSO is a complex climatic phenomenon. In modern days, it occurs every three to eight years on average and brings to the north coast of Peru, which is the epicenter, heavy rains, flooding, and erosion, as well as a local depression of the thermocline which reduces marine upwelling and causes nutrient-rich waters not to reach the surface, which has implications for fisheries there. On the left here on the screen, right there, we have normal conditions. So equatorial trade winds in the Pacific Ocean are blowing from east to west, and warm water is driven to the western Pacific. The image to the right shows an El Nino event during which trade winds weaken or even reverse directions. Warm surface temperature anomalies occur in the central or eastern Pacific Ocean. There are different manifestations of what we know as El Nino. We have the Central Pacific or Madoki events, and these are different, this is different from standard El Nino events. Here on the top, we have warm water cooling in the Central Pacific. These Central Pacific events have become more frequent in recent decades, but we're not certain if they actually occurred earlier in the Holocene. So like I mentioned, my research takes place in coastal Peru, South America. This is an arid desert with strong marine outlying just off the coast, and it's a productive marine environment for this reason. We've also had human populations throughout the Holocene, and as you'll see, this is really important for the research that I do. Archaeological and geological records show that El Nino activity and intensity is varied throughout the Holocene. This means variability in sea surface temperatures, average strength of marine upwelling, and precipitation evaporation ratios, to name some. This also means changes in the variable recurrence rates of El Nino events themselves. El Nino shifts during the mid to late Holocene are associated with cultural change on the north coast of Peru. This is settlement pattern, changes in the way humans are exploiting resources, as well as the construction of monumental architecture, large mounds, and pyramids, as you can see here, a site of Los Morteros. We also see the first use of irrigation canals in South America, which may be linked to changes in ENSO patterns here in Peru. Despite all we do know about El Nino and its impacts on culture, there are still many unknowns and contradictions within what we call the ENSO record itself. And this is what my dissertation addresses. This is a comprehensive metadata study which I feel is needed to understand how spatially, temporally, and wildly diverse proxies fit, contradict, or correlate with one another. So in Peru, long-term continuous climate proxies, such as lake pores, marine pores, or near shore or offshore corals, aren't existing. We do have, however, archaeological proxies because of the history of human occupation in this region. And these data have proved to be among the most promising source for paleoclimate reconstruction of ENSO here. 
So this is a component of my dissertation, evaluating the individual proxies we used to build this chronology throughout the Holocene. Unlike terrestrial proxies, mollusks directly track changes in sea surface temperature and upwelling. They incorporate carbon and oxygen isotopes in their shell aragonite or calcium carbonate structures. And they could be sourced from archaeological sites. So here is a transect running perpendicular to the lines of growth on a mollusk shell sample. Sampling protocol is to sample individual growth rings if possible. And new growth occurs daily in the direction of the ventral margin here, away from the quadrifor or hinge of the bivalve. You can get down to the daily or even sub-daily level. So with these different species of shells that I'll be collecting, and I'll get into this fieldwork component of my research in just a minute, I'll be looking at a number of things. First of all, oxygen isotope ratios are indicative of marine conditions during bivalves' lifespans. This is because delta O18 in mollusk shells, or rather oxygen isotopes, precipitate in isotopic equilibrium with ocean water. Because of this temperature dependence, we can use Grossman and Coos equation to drive sea surface temperatures based on this relationship. Previous research has showed us that isotopic ratios in mollusks are strongly associated with anomalous sea surface temperatures and atmospheric pressure in the equatorial Pacific. Researchers have also confirmed strong correlations between sea surface temperature and aragonitic delta O18 with modern samples and reported sea surface temperatures. Biomineralization patterns or growth breaks you might see along the shell have also strongly correlated with warming events known as El Nino events. While we rely on the, this temperature dependence uh, of oxygen-18 isotope fractionation during biomineralization. Fractionation also varies according to mollusk species. So this is something that we really need to understand in order to be able to robustly use these as indicators for past sea surface temperature. <coughs> I'll also be looking at mollusk and carbon isotopes. Delta, carbon, delta 13C tracks changes in near shore upwelling associated with events and increases in the heavier carbon isotope may reflect a reduction in upwelling. Again, fractionation is species dependent, so this is an important thing to keep in mind when using these as proxies. So, to talk about the field work that I'll be doing this upcoming season, I um, need to introduce the concept also of biogeography. Biogeography, or species range of mollusks, helps us reconstru reconstruct past short and long term sea surface changes, as well as other paleo or modern environmental conditions. Shown here on the right are modern species ranges for these bivalves that are found commonly in archaeological contexts along the north coast and the rest of the coast of Peru. This upcoming season, I'll be traveling to Peru to collect, water, uh, collect species from Paita, Cayo, Pisco, and Hilo. I'll also take water temperature and salinity measurements and record environmental information. When I have these samples, and this is multiple samples of multiple different types of species from these locations, I'll be able to compare them to find which mollusks we can find from archaeological sites should be our best representative of different conditions such as upwelling, such as changes in sea surface temperature or sea surface temperature anomalies, or changes in salinity 
due to end zone events. To do this, I'll perform growth rate analysis, cutting the valves perpendicular to their growth, like that growth line I showed you earlier, preparing acetate peel impressions, and preparation for sampling. I'll drill samples from these different growth periods along the transects to obtain calcium carbonate for delta 018 and delta 13C analysis, as well as for radiocarbon dating and AMS carbon 14 measurements to calculate PMZ. I'll be looking at the stable isotope ratios, like I said, of oxygen and carbon via mass spectrometry. And in future stages, I will use delta 13C values to correct for isotopic fractionation that I mentioned when evaluating differences in carbon isotopes due to changes in upwelling during end zone events. I'll then use paleo temperature equations, probably a modified version of Grossman and Coos, to convert these ratio ratios into sea surface temperatures, which I'll be able to compare to modern records from the Peruvian Institute of the Sea, which has daily and weekly averages for sea surface temperature that I'll, like I said, compare to these modern shell samples. And so just to wrap up, the broader impacts of this research, understanding past variations of ENSO is important for understanding cultural change as well as climate. This case study will help us find which mosques are best for reconstructions of these various things like upwelling, sea surface temperature, like I mentioned. And overall, this dissertation will enhance our understanding of proxies we use to reconstruct past environments and make stronger ties, hopefully, between culture change, human behavior, and abrupt climate change on the North Coast of Peru. Thanks for your time. Any questions? I just... I think you meant to say, I'll include, but when you're looking at the various isotopes of carbon that are indicators of upwelling, carbon-14 is also, all yes. during normal non-El Nino conditions, you get a lot of old carbon coming up and incorporated in the shells. And this address that all showed in 2005, yeah. during El Nino, with the thermocline depressed, it's only mixed surface water and it goes into equilibrium with the atmosphere. And that's really clear, at least in one species. We don't know about others and those would be really useful to look at. Also, there was a major event in 2017, at least on the north half of Peru, which is if your shells go back that far, will make a very nice laboratory experiment in the effects of El Nino on these shells. So it's a good time to collect. Exactly, thanks for that comment. And I think that is really highlights one of the main components of this research comparing these certain species. We know that one species of many of these commonly found shells do reflect these changes, but we're not sure about others. So that's why I'll be doing this comparative study to try to figure out which ones as archaeologists or climatologists we should be looking to when we're doing our reconstructions. Thank you. All right, so we're going to have a 20 minute break. Uh, just before we go, I said I wasn't going to do it, but I can't resist that Susan's talk was just such a fertile feeding ground for puns. I have to say <coughs> that we just can't whitewash over this Lyme disease problem. It seems like we're going to pay dearly for it. Um, Mainers should be ticked off about suffering from climate change largely caused by others. That raises the question of whether we should flee Maine, you know, kind of bug out of here. Thank you. See you point. <laughs> Yes. I, well, should I stop it? Um,